Hello there, my fellow alien infiltrators, and welcome back to another episode of Warhammer 40k lore on the Insidious Tyranids. Today we will return once more to our Gene Stealer cult subtopic. However, this time, we are gonna go into more detail on the creation and organization of one of these cults, from the moment of their inception to the point where they can launch their attack. We're also gonna learn about the multiple stages, or generations, as they are known, making up the cult members. I am your host, the hive mind narrator for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The genesis of a gene stealer cult is a strange and disturbing process. Though it does obey a loosely cyclical structure, many offshoots and bastardizations occur resulting in a spectrum of anatomies from the outwardly wholesome to the truly bizarre. All members of this tainted family tree, even the non-hybrid members known as brood brothers, remain fiercely loyal to each other, bound as one by the gestalt psychic brood mind. The most powerful weapon of the gene stealer cult is actually secrecy. From the moment the infection vector arrives to the grand uprising itself, the faithful stick to the shadows. The elements that emerge into the light of everyday life wear a mask of mundanity. Outwardly, the cultists worship the same deity as the host civilization, albeit a strange variant thereof. They also teach extreme modesty, keeping their mutations hidden under robes and industrial clothing. Later generation hybrids work tirelessly, respecting the old and cherishing the young. Only on the day of reckoning is the awful truth of their existence revealed. A first generation hybrid is as much a monster as it looks. More reminiscent of a gene stealer than a man, these foul creatures feature between five and six limbs, each one ending in a sharp talon. Their bulbous heads have the facial features of their Xeno's gene father, with their skin taking on a purple hue. The creatures are little more than beasts, their instincts directing them all the way. The second generation of hybrids are hunched and stooped, but not in the manner of old men or the infirm, but more like pressured springs, ready to explode at a moment's notice. Like the generation before them, the second generation hybrids may have five or six limbs, but their eyes and mouth are more like their human parents, and they can make themselves understood in low gothic. Though their minds are still so alien as to defy analysis, they are still sapient enough to understand their host society. Some are even put to work in the industrial brotherhoods of their kind, their uncanny strength and resilience allowing them to use heavy mining tools and explosives with far greater ease than any mere human. Taking a fully upright stance, the third generation hybrid is reminiscent of many mutants in Imperial society. Their foul features go unnoticed in the underhive of many Imperial worlds. However, on closer inspection, their alien form is revealed. They still have heavily ridged heads mauve to violet skin, and may even have an extra pair of arms under their tattered clothes. By the fourth and final generation, integration-wise, the scions of the gene stealer cult can pass as fully human, inveigling themselves into positions of power to further the aims of their sinister cult. They are often lauded by their human overseers as dutiful, hard-working citizens, and as such often find themselves above suspicion. Many of these hybrids even join the Imperial Guard to spread their vile seed across the galaxy, starting brand new cults and claiming worlds for their four-armed patriarch. Those cults unearthed by the Inquisition have a common hierarchy, largely dictated by the generations and cycles of Zeno's infestation. Though variations do occur, the patriarch is analogous to the monarch of a kingdom with the Magus as his Grand Vizier and the Primus as the leader of his abominable armies. Every iteration of the gene stealer infestation can spread anarchy and disaster. Better known as Brood Cycles, the mockeries of family lineage that form the framework of each cult are all the slaves of the Patriarch's will. To celebrate his magnificent strangeness by echoing his form is a privilege like no other. 
Though they all pay homage to the Patriarch, each brood cycle has a strong internal coherence, and many will bear markings that bind them further to their brothers within the cult. Though the broods of each cycle are similar in organization, the gene stealer curse does not conform to the strictures of mortal science. Anomalous bioforms rise to the surface with each generation, for interbreeding within the cult is very common, and tyrannid gene matter is, by its very nature, very mutable. Even as the second and subsequent cycles spread the infection anew, the original brood cycle will still be active casting the web of the Patriarch's influence even further. A fully mature gene stealer cult is huge. It can number in the millions or even in the billions, maybe even more if it covers multiple worlds. The cult of the Pauper Princes, for example, originated on the world of Chancer's Vale, but has taken its fervent creed to the sentinel world of Vigilus and 15 other planets besides. The original instance, known as the Genesis Infestation, is the most numerous, but all subsequent infestations, sometimes also known as Splinter Cults, have much the same coloration of chitin and flesh. There might be small differences in the markings and even temperament, but they are nonetheless cut from the same cloth. They may even use fundamentally the same heraldic colors to show their wider allegiance. Necessity often demands that these colors are adapted to fit in with local uniforms and societal norms, but armbands and tattoos are sometimes employed as well as a unifying feature, albeit often hidden from sight. All the cultists of a given world are known as an infestation, and each populous area can propagate several full brood cycles. All the cultists in a given population center are known as a gene sect. Some populations are only big enough to support one gene sect, but on the worlds that are teeming with life, several can coexist. Though each gene sect can further differentiate itself with markings and subtleties of coloration, ultimately they all hail from the same patriarch, and usually work together seamlessly. Each gene sect has its own specialist bioforms and war leaders, including a Magus, a Primus, and a Nexos. These ones usually hail from the fourth generation and hence can pass as human. So close they are in thought and deed, that they and their peers in other gene sects may even band together to fight in the same place at the same time. The gene sects, usually at least several hundred strong, are then further subdivided into so-called claws. The claws typically number between 50 and 100 warriors formed for special duty and these are assembled and disbanded according to the cult needs. The Claws will have at least one leader figure guiding them in their mission, and each Magus and Primus will have several Claws at their disposal, ranging from neophyte groups which can pass for human, to monstrous breeds of aberrants that are unmistakably alien. Once the cult reaches a point of maturity when it feels safe enough that it can spare the resources to spread, it sends out a gene stealer, or even a whole brood of gene stealers, to find a new prey. These ones will either come from the original brood to have made planetfall, known as the first curse, or the pure strain gene stealers of a brood cycle's fifth generation. These vectors of infection will start a new gene sect should they find another suitable population center on the same world, or an entirely new infestation if they reach a planet that can support a splinter of the original cult. Usually, each planet can only have one patriarch, but it can have many Maguses and Primuses as its lieutenants in different parts of the planet. If the existing Patriarch dies, the next gene stealer to have infected a host on that planet will adapt and grow to become the new Patriarch over time. There are some exceptions, of course, should an infestation's outrider organisms find a population center so rich in life, it has the equivalent of a small planetary population unto itself, the pure strain gene stealer that is sent out to colonize it can become a new Patriarch in its own right. This, however, will only happen rarely on continuous land masses, due to the psychic backlash that could result, but provided there is a big enough distance between the sites, it can theoretically occur. The two gene sects will be competing with each other, though, and may even come into conflict, but when the High Fleet arrives, the Gestalt mind of the Tyranid race takes control over everyone. 
From the moment the first hybrid is born, the cult begins preparation for a world-spanning war of insurrection. There are other factors which can trigger a large military-scale intervention, sometimes before the dynasty is ready. Woe betide those who derail the cult's master plan, for their warriors strike serpent fast, and their vengeance is terrible. The gene stealer cults are concerned with their own propagation above everything else, and will usually only commit to an armed insurrection on its own terms. There remain some exceptions, of course, for in the crumbling edifice of the Imperium, even the most watertight plans do not hold long in practice. On occasion, an incautious power grab or roving aberration may lead to the cult being investigated by the Imperial authorities. If an inquest from the Adeptus Arbites, or even worse, the Inquisition, cannot be dealt with by a visit from the Magus and his minions, the cult may soon find itself under attack by anything from a regiment of Imperial Guard to a strike force of the Death Watch. Though this caliber of attack can eradicate a gene stealer cult to its very core, all it takes is one Tyranid lifeform to escape and the cult begins again. Such purges, though, are not very common, as the cult only spreads its infection in the shadow, and among the vast, sprawling confusion of the Imperium, there are millions of locations where one cannot be easily discovered. With the cult members inducted from the indigenous population, they have an enormous advantage. Those recruited from the underbelly of society are already wise enough to know the best places to hide, whereas those from the upper echelons already have the influence to cover their tracks. Over time, the cult spreads its influence from one stratum of civilization to another. A mature cult with several brood cycles will have anything from sewer jacks, factotums and autoproctors to high justices and spire lords under its sway. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you on these creepy gene stealer cults for today. I can't be the only one to think that this topic would make a great horror movie material. It could be a mix of alien and invasion of the body snatchers. Especially since the tyranids and gene stealers themselves are inspired by the xenomorph. What are your thoughts on these creatures and cults after what you learned today? As always, you are welcome to share your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. And also click the bell notification icon to stay a bit more up to date. Thank you very much for watching and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.